And let's turn to the book of Philemon tonight. We got Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and the Thessalonians and the Timothys, and then Titus and Philemon. We started the book of Philemon uh, a little while back, and then we we uh, got away from it for a few Sunday nights. Um, the story of the book of Philemon is Philemon was a a, a real uh, respected Christian man in that part of the world, and um, he had a runaway slave, and the runaway slave his name was Onesimus, and he ran away and was gone for some time, but while he was gone. He came across the Apostle Paul, and Paul led him to Jesus Christ. And when he led him to Christ, he was transformed. And um, he actually uh, helped Paul. He became a, um, a, a supplier for Paul there in the prison and would bring him food and the things that he needed. And Paul decides that it's time to uh, send Onesimus back to Philemon, um, at least temporarily. And that's what this book is about. Paul writes a letter to Philemon as a Christian brother and says, I'm, I'm sending Onesimus back. And he says, I want you to receive him because now he's your brother in Christ. So that's sort of the setting for the book. Verse one, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. And to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may, be, may become effectual by the acknowledge of acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me, whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him, that is, mine own vows, whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind I would do nothing, that thy benefit should not be, as it were, of necessity, but willingly. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this. This evening, we thank you for this portion of Scripture. Lord, we want to pray again for uh, Dale's uh, brother and sister. We pray that you'd help them both physically and spiritually, Lord. God, we think of Cora tonight. We pray that you would uh, bless her, comfort her. Lord, just keep her mind and her heart. And uh, Lord, guide her in the, the decisions, the things that will be decided in the next few days. God, we pray that you'd work in Duncan's family. Lord, in the next several days, there'll be some things that will come out of this. And, and um, Lord, we pray that you work in their hearts. Lord, uh, we want to pray for the Lindsay baby again. And we pray that you would uh, help the Lindsay baby to quickly recover. And God bless now as we open your book. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 11 is what I want to draw your attention to tonight. Uh, verse 10, he says, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. And he contrasts the time past 
and now. Paul said, um, you know, Philemon, it's different now with Onesimus. And what a difference Jesus Christ makes and what a difference he makes immediately in the short term and for the rest of that life. And this is one of the infallible marks of real salvation is there's always a change that takes place. Um, it is begun the moment of salvation. It, it's never complete at that moment, but it is begun at that moment. He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Paul said to the Galatians, having begun in the spirit. And, you know, at that moment of salvation, something happens on the inside. There's there's nothing nonchalant about that. And there, it, it's it's a man. It's a real crisis experience there. Some people, you know, are just, you know, man, they, they get saved and they're really certain right away. And some people, uh, they, they really wrestle with the exact moment of when it take, took place. But, man, it's it's a it's a definite moment. And you, you may not remember the exact moment, but but boy, there's a there's a place. There's a time. Yeah, there's a season. And uh, man, you remember coming into that. You remember God dealing with you. It was interesting. I heard a preacher talking to you the other day and he was talking to a bunch of Christian young people at a uh, at a Christian school, a private school. And um, and it was a, an independent Baptist school. I mean, it was a place where all these uh, uh, there were a lot of Baptist churches in the area and they they sent their a lot of them sent their kids there. So these were, you know, you can use the term Christian school, but that that term can be very generic. And sometimes it, it really doesn't mean a whole lot. But this was a school set up and run and filled uh, from parents of, of uh, Christian homes and that really believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so this preacher gets invited to preach that day. And uh, the pastor of the church is sitting on the platform. And there's like three or four hundred uh, students out there, uh, you know, upper high school age. And uh, he's. He's getting started with his message and he was just going to lay some groundwork. And so he asked a question, not anticipating the reaction he got. He said, how many of you young people in this room remember when God began to deal with you about your lost condition and your need of Christ? He said, how many of you remember, you know, what that felt like in that, that point in your life? And he said, there was one young man that raised his hand. There was one of the faculty that raised his hand and the pastor raised his hand. And the pastor said, suddenly realized I was in a dilemma. He said, what do I do now? He said, I turned around and looked at the preacher. And he said, you know, I thought maybe I worded it wrong. Because, you know, you can think you said something the right way and you really said it the wrong way. You said it in a confusing manner. So I backed up and I said it again. He said, I, I said, how many of you, you, you remember that point where, man, you heard the gospel and and you became impressed with your need of Jesus Christ. And you knew that you needed to receive him. And how many of you remember that? And he said, the same three or four hands went up. And he said, I looked at the preacher and he said, what do I do now? He said, uh, I really couldn't go on with my message unless I preached the gospel to them. You know, and, and began to urge them. Because, you know, you don't, you don't just nonchalantly walk into Christianity. Recently, I heard it. Um, you know, a, a, a young, a young, a young lady was asked, uh, you know, um, when, when were you, when were you, uh, you know, goes to a church in this area? And she said, when did you come to know Christ? She said, oh, I've, I've always been a Christian. Wrong. That's not possible. You know, and maybe in her mind, and there's churches that equate it with being, um, you know, well, oh, I, I grew up in church or I grew up in this denomination or whatever. But that's not salvation because salvation is a birth. It's a new birth. It happens at a definite time and it turns a person around and it changes them just like it did Onesimus. You know, you don't you don't just ease into it. You don't just. Say, so, you know, I think I agree with all that. No, no, no. It's it's something that God does. Jesus said, no man can come to me except the Father draw him. Man, there's a there's something that happens. You know, we could ask for testimonies tonight, and I'm sure several of you could tell how you first heard the gospel, and, and man, you were troubled in your heart. But then comes that moment of salvation. 
that moment when you realize you're lost, you realize that all your religion was not enough, or you realize what a heathen you were. You realized how you'd broken God's law and, and you heard about heaven and hell and you realize, man, I need Jesus Christ because I'm, I'm going to hell. And you, you realize that and you called on his name. And boy, when you did that, something happens within. Something happens. The Bible describes it several different ways. A new nature is given. A new, a new nature is given. You still got the old nature, but a new nature is given. Man, a new nature is birthed inside of you. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Paul wrote to the Ephesians and, and he said, uh, and you hath he quickened. Quickened means made alive. He said, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Paul said that when you and I got saved, he said, ye have received the spirit of adoption. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit. The spirit of God comes in and he works in our inner man and he bears witness that we are the children of God. First Corinthians six, it says he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Something happens within. And very quickly, it is visible. Very quickly, it's visible. You know, the, um, the story of the guy that was possessed with that legion of devils Jesus Christ comes up and, and man, he gets saved and, um, and immediately. You know where this guy had been before that? The Bible says he, he lived in the tombs. He was always cutting himself. He was always crying and wailing. People had tried to calm him down. People had tried to rehabilitate him and bind him with chains and he broke the chains. He was a wild man. But he meets Jesus and suddenly... He is sitting at the sitting at the feet of Jesus and clothed. Because the Bible says before that he wear no clothes. He was clothed and in his right mind. The Samaritan woman, she meets the Lord and suddenly now she drops everything. And all she wants to do is tell everybody that she has just met the Savior. Matthew the Bible says he was a publican and the publicans were despised by the Jewish people. They were considered traitors to their own people because they collected taxes for the Romans. Matthew meets Jesus and he immediately leaves his crooked employment and immediately. I mean, the Lord calls Matthew in one verse and in the next verse, the scene changes. And Matthew has gathered up all his publican publican friends and sinners at his house to meet with Jesus. Zacchaeus meets Jesus Christ and immediately, like on the spot, within the hour, he looks at Jesus Christ and he acknowledges all the people that he had robbed because he was another tax collector. Tax collectors have a reputation. Uh, he was another tax collector and he immediately decides to repay all the people he'd robbed. But you know what he said? He said, Lord, if I have robbed any man by false accusation, he said, I'm going to pay him back fourfold. He said, in other words, I'm going to pay him back four times what I took. Uh, that sounds like pretty sincere, wouldn't you say? In our text in Philemon, Paul says to Philemon, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. There's that new birth, that new life, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. Paul said, he said, Philemon, he said, you, you remember. He said, Onesimus, was unprofitable. 
He was worthless. Uh, that's the dictionary definition of unprofitable. He was worthless. He was useless. He was unproductive. Being profitable has to do with something being of a benefit or something giving you an advantage. It has to do with helping things forward or being a help. And Onesimus was supposed to be a, a servant. That's what he was hired to do. But man, when, you know, I, I, I know this is totally foreign to us. But Philemon goes to buy a servant. You know, they used to do that. And, uh, you know, Philemon obviously was a man of some means and some wealth. And so he goes and he, he sizes up all these guys. You know, the reason he had purchased Onesimus was because he looked like a good deal. He looked like he could handle whatever work he was going to put on him. But you know what he found out when he got him home? He was dead weight. Philemon found out he could not count on him. Which in time past was to the unprofitable. But now, Paul said. But now all that had changed. Now there was a want to in Onesimus' heart. Now there was a desire and a drive. And now all of a sudden he had become a man of action. Now Onesimus looked for a way to help. And it was as natural as breathing. You say, how do you know that? Um, well, we're going to tell you in just a minute. Um, this whole thing of Onesimus serving Paul was bizarre. But you know, when somebody really meets the Lord, it really changes them. And people on the outside go, man, this is strange. Now he looked for a way to help and it was just as natural as breathing. You know, I wouldn't give you a nickel for somebody that you have to browbeat and follow around. And you know, uh, you know some people are really slow to learn this. Um, you know, as a parent, you better train your child when they're young to just be obedient when they're this high. And, and God says, you know, chase thy son. He shall give thee rest. He shall bring delight to thy soul. You know, you, you get to an unwilling teenager. You get an unwilling adult. And, you know, you're just you just reach this point where you're just wasting your breath. And you're wasting your stress. You know, something's got to happen on the inside. But Onesimus's heart had come alive. There was now compassion. There was now a desire to help somebody else without pay. Now he was glad to serve and it was a strange service. And the reason we say that is because Paul is in bonds. Paul is in prison here. Paul is in chains and Paul spent a lot of time in chains. And Onesimus is now serving an outcast. Look with me, uh, keep your place here, and look at 2 Timothy chapter, chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Just back up a few pages to the left. And you'll see 2 Timothy chapter 1. It wasn't just that now Onesimus was willing to go back to work. It wasn't just that, you know, Onesimus could have just thought, oh, wow, well, I need to go to work now. And he could have just disappeared and, you know, fled to another region and just got another job somewhere else and just worked diligently. That, that alone would have been good. But that's not what he does. He is now serving an outcast. Look at 2 Timothy 1, verse 15. Paul writes to Timothy, and he says, This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, are of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. Notice, the Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me 
and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And then how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. You know, Paul brings up another guy that helped him out. And Paul says, you know, the thing that was impressive was he was not ashamed of my chain. Onesimus is now serving an outcast. You know, Paul stands in front of Agrippa in that famous, you know, message to King Agrippa. And at the end of the message, Agrippa says, Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And then Paul says, I would to God that not only thou, but all that hear me this day were both almost and all together such as I am. He said, I, I wish you were all believed today. He said, he said, I wish you were all together such as I except these. And as Paul said it, he must have held up his shackles. He said, I wish you were all together such as I except these bonds. Years ago, there was a man that preached at uh, Portage Hill Prairie, Manitoba, and his name was Mark Bishop. And uh, some of you might be familiar with John Bishop. His, his dad was a, a preacher who, who became well known. He had gotten, um, I think it was cerebral meningitis, and literally he survived it. Uh, but, but when he survived it, it literally erased his brain. Uh, John Bishop, his dad, it literally erased his brain. Now, John Bishop had been a pastor before that. And uh, John Bishop comes out of, um, of uh, the coma and, um, and he suffered with severe pain, severe headaches and, and a lot of issues. But you know the one thing he didn't forget was the Bible and the Lord. There is something supernatural about being a Christian. It runs a whole lot deeper than just a bunch of stuff you've been taught in your head. And if that's all you got, you don't got the real thing because he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. There's more than just your head in this thing if it's real. It's the spirit of the living God. I've heard more than one story about a person that lost their memory as a believer, but they never lost their love for the Lord and they came out of it and they didn't know anybody on the planet, but they still knew the Lord and they still knew they were Christians. And they still knew they were saved. John Bishop comes out of his coma. And uh, he didn't even know who his wife was. And she introduced herself. and She took him home. And, and it was square one. I mean, literally. He said, she, she said, now, I'm a woman. And you're a man. She said, I'm your wife. You're my husband. And he said, I, I learned to like that after a while. <laughs> and he said but literally it took me back to square one but his love for the word of god and and that was never lost and he he began to preach again and it was the sweetest thing some of you could find his messages online he would he would stumble in his reading and he would stumble through but but it was just it was just it was powerful because it was like, one guy said this, it was like God erased his old character and his old personality and God had taken an innocent child and put him in the pulpit again. And it was unbelievable. Well, we met his son and his son was preaching at a youth event in Portage La Prairie, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago. And um, Brother Mark Bishop, his son, when he got college age, had went to Pensacola Christian College down in Pensacola, Florida. Pensacola Christian College, it's a great big monstrosity of a college. And, and it is, it is, uh, it's not super conservative, but they they preach the gospel and and uh it's it's you can learn a lot of secular things there. And people go there for nursing and people go there for law and, and all that stuff. Well, Mark Bishop went there. He said, I was a, quite the basketball player, and he, he said, uh I uh, I got there and and I was on their ball team, and, and Pensacola's a huge place. Like, I don't know what the count is now, but it used to have a couple thousand students. And he said, uh, he said, I 
I was there to study for the ministry. And he said, I, uh, you had to have some ministry volunteer stuff that you did. That was part of the program. And he said, so I got involved in the prison ministry. And he said, uh, I, I figured out that, that I could get permission to go in and play basketball with the prisoners. And I said, you got to understand when you're playing with convicts and you're playing basketball, it's a whole different ball of wax. He said, it is no holds barred, man. He said, it was rough. And he said, but we, I started playing basketball with them. And then we had Bible studies with them. And, and he said, and they started getting saved. One would get saved and then another and then another. And he said, then I realized, you know, you know, as much as I can, may, maybe I can get permission to bring these guys to church and, you know, and, you know, get them baptized, you know, that'd be the next step. And he said, so I got permission. And he said, uh, I got permission from the prison. He said, I, I didn't think to mention it to the college. <laughs> he said, I, I got permission from the prison. Now, one thing you have to understand at Pensacola Christian College is their, their church services, they have what they call the campus church. Okay, so, and most of the students are there on a Sunday morning. So, again, you've got, you know, this massive auditorium, and you've got all these college students in there, and the faculty, you know, and a bunch of people from the local area that come to the church. And he said, it was Sunday morning, and uh, it's televised. Okay, you got to remember that. It's televised in that area. And he said, so I, I, I rolled in with this, with this van, and he said, I had about 10 or 12 prisoners in the van, and they're all dressed in bright orange coveralls. <laughs> and he said, and they've all got their shackles on. And he said, I bring them in. I march them right up to the front and set them down, and, and the service begins. He said, we got away with that once or twice. And then the wonderful brethren said, um, you can't do that. We can't have that here. He said, I was fit to be tied. You talk about real converts. He said, I had them. There they were. Which in time past were unprofitable. But the Holy Ghost of God had changed. But you see, you see that whole thing of, of someone being outcast and the stigma. And Onesimus is not a prisoner. Paul is the prisoner. And, you know, I mean, you know, uh, uh, preachers have never got any special status in a prison. And he's a political prisoner and he's an outcast. He's wearing shackles, man. He's, he's not. They're not. The business guys of the city are not rolling by his window going, hey, dude, we'll help get you out. They're, no, they, they're just they're just uh, he's a prisoner. You know what Onesimus is doing here? He's serving an outcast. You know what's crazy about that? I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us all the mechanics of, of how he was getting stuff to Paul. But you know what Onesimus could have done? Onesimus could disappear. And nobody would ever know. You say, what do you mean? Okay, so, so Paul leads him to the Lord. Okay, let's let's picture it. Maybe it wasn't this way at all. But here's Paul, and he's in a dungeon, and there's a window right there. Okay. And somehow Paul leads Onesimus to the Lord. Maybe they start holding conversations through that window. And Paul leads him to the Lord. Well, that would have been a wonderful thing, and Onesimus could have went his way. But he didn't. He looks down that window, he says, Paul, he says, What do you need? And you've got to understand. You know, these prisons to this day overseas are not like our prisons. You know, I, I know about a, uh, a, a Russian uh, uh, pastor's sons. They got thrown in prison in Russia somewhere. And the only thing that kept them food was their mom and a couple other people kept bringing them food. It's not like here. It's not cushy and nice and you know, and you can complain to the to the ethics officer. You know, somebody hurts your feelings and you get wonderful food. And you get no, 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 no. And Onesimus goes, Paul, would you like some food? Paul said, would I ever? Paul said, I, Paul describes his life. He said, I was in fastings oft. He said, I served the Lord in hunger. Say, what do you mean? It was 12 noon on Sunday. No, he there was nothing to eat. On many occasions, probably for days on end. 
And Onesimus says, Paul, he says, man, I'll get you some food. Onesimus is now a believer and he keeps coming back and he keeps coming back and he keeps coming back. And now Onesimus has taken Paul on as his project. And Onesimus, out of love for the Lord Jesus Christ and out of love for Paul, he wants to serve the Lord. You know, some people, they, you know, they want to serve the Lord, but they want this position. You know, they want a microphone. They want something. And, but they miss the opportunities. And here was an opportunity. Onesimus said, man, I'm going to do what I can. You know, Onesimus could have one day said, you know, I got better things to do. There's some pretty girls out here. I'm just going to move on. But he never did. Now Onesimus had fallen in love with the service of Jesus Christ. What a change from what he had been not long before. He was profitable. And the prophet was to other people. Look with me at Luke chapter 12 for a moment. Luke chapter 12. Luke 12. Verse 13, Luke 12, verse 13. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he may divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Jesus said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years, take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. You know, um, um, it's, it's easy to, uh, I, I think it's the natural thing. To profit, you know, yourself. But man, something had changed. You know, before Onesimus got saved, everything he did was all about profiting himself. But now he was out to profit someone else. You know, in Matthew 25, verse 30, the Lord gives the parable of the uh, of the talents. And you know, one guy, you know, uh, doubles his talents and the next guy doubles his and then the one guy hides his the lord says to the first guys well done thou good and faithful servant but to the last one who didn't do anything with what god had given him the lord said cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness you know, that's the picture of uh, every lost person is um, their, 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 their life is unprofitable. What a difference Jesus Christ had made. Our Lord's salvation makes a person, makes a person profitable. Look at verse 12 of Philemon. Verse 11, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me, whom I have sent again. And Paul says here, Philemon, I'm, I'm sending him back. 
Now, what was going to happen with this was going to speak volumes about both Onesimus and Philemon. Can you imagine? You know, you you look at this this slave, and uh, and you say, uh, you know, he's been with you. He's been taking care of you. He's been helping you out. I mean, you've led him to the Lord, and um, and one day you look at him and you say, you've got to go back to your master. You know what Onesimus did with that was going to speak volumes about his about his Christianity. Even as a saved person, would you want to face that? What if you weren't well received? Some of that stuff had serious legal consequences. Some of that stuff could you they could beat you half to death. What Onesimus could look him in the face and say, "Okay, Paul." He could look up in that prison bars, or maybe the dungeon was down. Oh, he could look down there and say, "Oh, oh, okay, Paul. Whatever you say." And then he could have ran for it and just Paul would have never known. But it was also going to speak volumes about Philemon. What was Philemon going to do? Philemon was a respected, well-known, true Christian. What was Philemon going to do when Onesimus came back to the door? Paul said, I have sent him back. Paul said, uh, let's fix this. Let's really fix it. Let's start over. Let's try again. Let's prove what God can do. You don't need to turn there, and I've already alluded to it, and I've often alluded to it in the last few months, but that same guy that was full of devils, that legion of devils, you know, he gets saved, the Lord casts all those devils out, and you guys remember the story. He says, Jesus, I want to follow you. And he was one of the only guys the Lord denied that request. He said, Lord, I want to be with you. And Jesus said, no. He said, I want you to go back. And in the book of Mark, it says, I want you to go back to your friends and show how great things God has done for thee. But in the book of Luke, when that story is recorded, it says the Lord said, return to your house. And show how great things God has done for thee. Man, it's one thing to go back to your friends. But it's another thing to go back to your house. Can you imagine the damage that he had done at his house? And the Lord said, I want you to go back to your house. That guy comes walking in. And I'm sure there were nosy neighbors and... And people look at it, and, you know, he probably had scars all over him from the cuts, but everybody could see that at least he was in his right mind. At least he was clothed. He wasn't a raging maniac like when he left. And you know what his coming home was going to do? It was going to prove what God could do. Uh, there was going to be a new husband walking in that door. There was going to be a new daddy walking in that door. Now he was going to be stable and normal and loving and working and caring, and smiling, and laughing, and calm, and so thankful. So thankful to be home. So thankful to be free. You know, he was covered in scars. The Bible says he spent his time in the tombs cutting himself. You know, cutting yourself is not anything new. It's always been a mark of the demonic. Always. I heard it. You know, I'm not going to get off on this, but this whole contemporary Christian thing, you know, that, you know, the churches that are like bars, you know, and they've got the rock band and all that. You know what a lot of those people do? You know, there's these little red flags that creep out and it's a lot of the, these Christian young people, they listen to that music and they cut their self. Praise the Lord. Nobody was cutting himself tonight when you were singing. Amen. Nobody. I don't even think there was an urge. I had to cough once or twice, but I didn't want to cut myself. <laughs> the scars. You know what he would do for the rest of his life? He'd look at the scars on his arms. And they would always remind him that he was finally free. For if the sun shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Paul said, uh, Onesimus, I, I bet that was a troubling day for Onesimus. Paul looks at him and says, Onesimus, 
you're saved, you love the Lord, you've been over backwards to help me. And now I got something hard I want you to do. I want you to go back to Philemon. You know, that bridge seemed burned. And Onesimus had burned it. And I just want to say here, be mighty slow to burn bridges. They're hard to rebuild. But Jesus Christ could rebuild it. And it would require something. It would require Onesimus to make a deep, hard decision to return and face his past. You know, uh, the Bible does say forgetting those things which are behind. Paul said that, you know, Paul had a past and it was an ugly one. But, you know, and the, the thought there is you're, you're not dwelling in that. You're not you're not living there. You're not always dredging it up. You're you know what? God's given you a new life and you go on. Um, but. But there was something that needed to be fixed. You remember God made Jacob face his past. Jacob had cheated his brother many years before. And one night he hears after many years that Esau is coming to meet him. Last time he heard about Esau, Esau had said, I'm going to kill you. And you know, that night he wrestles with the angel and, and, um, and God God helped him and he faced his past and he made it. I just want to say this. I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't I don't say this with anybody in mind. I just said it because I saw it in the text. But, you know, um, there, there's some things you can't fix. You know, there, 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 literally there's some things you can't fix. There's too much water over the dam. But there may be. There may be something that the Lord wants you to fix. And if that's the case, probably even as the words left in my mouth, you thought of it. Can I encourage it tonight? You dread it. You fear it. You fear the reaction. It was your fault. You blew it. You made a mess. You hurt somebody. You manipulated something. You robbed somebody. Yes, you did it. We've all done it. And if the Lord says, I want you to go talk to him and I want you to make it right. Can I encourage you tonight? The Lord Jesus will help you face that past. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And if he's the one that's putting it in your heart, he's going to go with you. In fact, in fact, he'll go ahead of you. It would require Onesimus to face his past, but it would require something else. It would require that in Philemon's heart, he would see some things right away. Here comes Onesimus. And of course, this is the letter to Philemon. Guess who's carrying the letter? Onesimus. He knocks at the door. And the door opens up and Philemon goes, fancy meeting you here. And Onesimus goes, I know, I know, I know. But before, before you, before you do anything, I got a letter for you from Paul. Philemon goes, okay. You got to remember these people were made just like you and me. Philemon didn't go, oh, great to see you. We have no idea the, the damage that Onesimus did or the money that he took from Philemon. We have no idea because Paul says later on in the letter, if he oweth thee aught, I will repay it. There's no telling the damage Onesimus had done. He, he didn't open that door and go, oh, great to see you. He thought, oh, well, since you're here, we're going to sell some things. And he says, Philemon, before you do anything, would you read this letter? Philemon reads that letter. 
And Philemon's heart would have to recognize a few things right away. That God was bigger than what had happened. Where some people, might be some people in this room, you are struggling with some stuff in your past. And you know what? It'll be a great day when you remember God is bigger than what happened. And you need to remember that God can change a person completely. And Philemon would have to realize that the loss that he had suffered at Onesimus' hands, that that loss actually had brought about Onesimus' salvation. And you know, for Onesimus really to have the right heart, he'd have to realize that he was nothing and Christ was all. And he'd have to realize something else. That even as he read that letter, that Jesus Christ himself was beseeching him. Look at it. Verse 8, Philemon 1, verse 8. Wherefore, Philemon, though I, Paul, might be bold in Christ, to enjoin thee, and of course we talk, the word enjoin means pressure, to enjoin thee that which is convenient. Yet for love's sake, he says, I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I, and he says it again, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus. You know, in Romans 12, 1, it says, I beseech thee, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. You know, can you imagine the Lord Jesus? He, he's, he's, he's the lawgiver. He's, he, man, he gives commands and he's got every right to command anything he wants from us. And yet, you know what he says? He says, I beseech you. Um, you know, when you read this book and you, you feel that tug on your heart that I, I really need to do this, I need to do that, I need to change this. I need to change my way of thinking. You know what that is? That's the Lord Jesus. He's your Savior. He's your Lord. Uh, man, he's the one that loved you with an everlasting love. And you know what he's doing? He's beseeching you. He, he could make you. He could come into your bedroom. He could put you in a headlock. He could, he could make you a zombie. He could make you. But he doesn't do that. You know what he does? He pleads. There's an imitation song. While we sing and while we plead and while you see your soul's deep need, will you come to Jesus now? You know what Jesus does? He pleads. He pleads. And Onesimus had changed. God had done a work. And Philemon was going to have to decide Am I going to deal with this from my side of the fence? Or I'm, am I going to deal with this for the Lord? And you know, you and me as believers, as, you know, a lost person, there that, that's not even an option for them. But as you and me as believers, as followers of people that have embraced Jesus Christ, um, you know, it's going to be real often that you're going to come up to something and you're going to go, okay, Am I going to deal with this like I want to deal with it? Or is it going to be Christ in me? Christ in me. Would, would Philemon see, you know what, this book, it's this, this one chapter, it's part of the word of, it's not the word of Paul, it's the word of God. Would Philemon, oh, he, he, He'd hear the voice of God. Some people can read the Bible and hear the preaching. They don't ever hear the voice of God. But Philemon wasn't like that. And the further we get into the book, you'll see uh, Philemon was an unusual Christian. And he was going to do exactly what Paul was asking him to do. But you know why he did that? Because he recognized this is the Lord. There's an old song and the chorus goes, keep in touch with Jesus. Though the path be dim 
Let no cloud nor shadow sever you from him. Joy or sorrow greet you. Friend or foe you meet. Keep in touch with Jesus. And he will keep you sweet. You know, by the time I even get done reading that letter, his whole attitude had changed. And the sweet spirit of Jesus Christ, the spirit that reconciled the world unto himself, when we were yet enemies, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I want to encourage you tonight. Keep in touch with Jesus. And he will keep you sweet. Is there something, something there in, in your past? I'm, I'm not a friend of digging through your past at all. And I, I'm not a, I'm not one of these guys that says you, you know, you got to try to make restitution for everything. I, you know, you know, the apostle, I had a friend, I had a guy, I closed with this. I had a guy in our church in Prince Albert. He came to me one day, one of the best guys I had, an amazing guy. He spent time on the mission field. And he came to me one day and he was weeping. He's about 30. He said, Pastor Newman, I need to talk to you. Now, whenever I had those kind of conversations, I knew something was up and usually it was not good. I had another guy came to me one day, said, Pastor, can I talk to you at the church tonight? It was like Tuesday night. I said, We're like right now? He said, Yeah, can we have church right now? I said, Yeah. He said, Pastor, he said, uh, I've been gambling. And uh, he started telling me the story and, and uh, he wanted to make it right. And he had been costing his family a fortune. And, and, and so here comes this other young guy and he says, he says, pastor, he said, uh, he's weeping. And I said, man, what, what, I pulled it, took him to my office. I said, what's going on? He said, pastor, he said, years ago, I did this. He said, do I have to tell the whole world that I did that? Do I have to come forward now? Do, he says, if I come forward with this now, in, and he began to explain it all. And um, you know what? We had a great conversation. He had confessed that thing to the Lord probably multiple times through the years. And the fact was, God had forgiven it the day he got saved. And as it turned out, it, it was not something that he needed to. Can I tell you? It's something he couldn't fix. Before Paul got saved, he destroyed home after home after home after home after home. He took families. He took dads away. He took moms away. He took them in chains. He busted up families. He killed people. He consented to the death of Stephen. He was a maniac. You know what? There's no way you can fix that. I heard a preacher say something recently that was very interesting. I don't know if it's true or not. We won't know until we get to glory. But he said, but you all know that, that when Paul writes to, to Timothy, Paul mentions his mom and his grandmother, but he doesn't mention his dad. And of course, we always say, oh, that's because he's heathen. And maybe that's true. Uh, the Bible says that all the Jews knew that his dad was a Greek. But one guy said, you know, could it be that Paul had been instrumental in putting his dad to death. And he said, what a burden he would have felt for that young man. He would have felt like he owed him everything. Whether that's true or not, all I'm saying is this, is there was no way Paul could make up his past. Couldn't be done. That's why Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. But there might be something tonight. And maybe the Lord's not asking you to square off with somebody, but maybe you just need to get along with the Lord. There might be something about your past that it's just to this day it haunts you. Well, you'd be amazed how many people. It still haunts you. And maybe you just need to go to the Lord and you need to get it under the blood and realize it is forgiven it is forgotten. It is buried in the deepest sea. As far as the east is from the west, it is gone forever. 
And you need to quit letting the devil hound you with that. In time past, he was unprofitable. But now, he is profitable. I think probably everybody in this room understands that experience. But if you don't, you need to understand it. You need to open your heart to Jesus Christ. Say, Lord Jesus, I've never experienced that. Lord, I would have been like those teenage kids in that Christian school. Lord, I don't ever remember really anything like that. You know what? That, that, ha that must be your experience. Ye must be born again. Jesus said that. Let's pray. Lord, bless your truth. Help your people, Lord. Help everybody in this room. Thank you, Lord, for the change you made in our life. And, Lord, that you've begun a good work. It's still ongoing. And, God, thank you, Lord, that you can help us face our past. And thank you, Lord that we can deal with every situation with you in us, Lord. We, we don't have to live and we don't have to decide and move and think in that old way. Lord, I pray you do your work in Jesus' name. Amen. God has spoken to you tonight while the piano plays. Why don't you talk to the Lord? Onesimus, he was glad to serve an outcast for Jesus Christ. Would you be glad to do that? What a change in the heart. If your heart's hard tonight, even as a believer, you need, you need to take that heart to the Lord.